When will I learn? There has rarely been a good sequel to a good horror movie. Rarely. I mean, there's plenty of bad sequels to great movies, but there's something about the horror genre. It just... When you produce a good first effort, it, it always seems like a flash in the pan. It always seems like they've bottled lightning somehow. Because they can never repeat the success. And now, granted, I haven't seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 or The Next Generation. I have seen the remake, you know, it was okay. <clears throat> but, and I know, I know this film has its fans. It does. And I can see why it does. You know, people who grew up with this film. Um, this film has garnered a cult following since it came out in 86. And I get that. Um, but I myself... Well, the film was maligned when it when it came out in eighty six. It got terrible reviews, and a lot of audience members balked at it. And I can see why, because when you grew, when if you'd seen the original, which I had the other day, and was absolutely blown away by it, like I said, and then this comes along, and. Okay. Hello, YouTubers. Welcome to Big Buddha is watching. I'm Big Buddha. Today, I'm talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. So, 1974, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre appears on the scene. Uh, like I said in the review for that film, you know, uh, an absolute sledgehammer to the senses of a movie. Uh, really changed the play, the face of horror cinema from then on and uh, inspired countless imitations, many famous imitations. So a real, uh, a real game changer in the horror genre. Cut forward to 1986 and Canon Pictures acquired the rights to the, Chex the Texas Chainsaw Manic... Ma <laughs> the Texas Chainsaw Manicure. Uh, which is a film, which is a short parody film actually that I believe one of the cast members was in, and uh, the yeah, it was the guy who played Chop Shop, uh, Bill Mosley, which got him the part. <laughs> uh, the, the Canon Pictures acquired the rights to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and wanted a sequel. And anyone who's seen the recent documentary film Electric Boogaloo. The Wild Untold Story of Canon Films, which I did watch just recently. Very entertaining film. Um, everyone's seen a few Canon films. Maybe not realise they were the same company, but they were the um, the the filmmaking factory of the 1980s. They produced many features um, with varying degrees of success in, in terms of... Um, quality you know uh, made a lot of money because they were a bit able to churn out pictures very cheaply and quickly a very quick turnaround and th this was one of the ones that just got fired out of the cannon uh, <laughs> no pun intended uh, back in 1986 and yeah uh, to varying degrees of quality uh, Hooper himself, Toby Hooper, the director, uh, returned to direct this film. Apparently, originally he wasn't going to return to direct. He was just going to produce the sequel. Uh, he didn't have a, a hand in the... Well, he, he, he doesn't have a writing credit on the film. Um, but apparently the, he couldn't find a director who was able to work for the the money that he wanted. Uh, he, he had to scale back the production. Originally... His original vision for the sequel was going to be a film called Beyond the Valley of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and was going to deal with a whole town of cannibals. He couldn't afford to make that film, so he had to scale it back somewhat and work for scale as a director when he couldn't find anyone to step into the brink. Um, I, I mean, I have to 
give him credit because I, I believe in Electric Boogaloo, he did say that um, it was pointless trying to recreate the success of the original, create recreate the same aesthetic and the same sense of uh, visceral dread and terror and hysteria that that film achieved. So in with this time around, he wanted to just go in a different direction, have a bit of fun and make a black comedy. And this film is a black comedy, you know, it's it's not even uh, like a subversive um, under the collar, um, under the radar sort of, oh, we, we snuck a comedy out in the guise of a horror movie. Now, this, this film is very much li listed as, uh, accredited as um, a black comedy horror movie. Um so, uh, you know, I've got to give him plaudits for at least owning up and saying, no, he didn't believe he was capable of recreating the success of the original. Um, however, you know, I, I can understand why audiences and critics bolt at this back in 86, because um, they were sold and went in believing this was going to be a follow on from the original not only in story but in tone and um they've been waiting 12 years for something that was going to bowl them over and what they got was yeah what what they got was something else what they got was um a laughter fest a, a, a satire a, a, an almost spoof on the on the horror genre on the 80s teen slasher movie which uh, almost a, a spoof and a critique on the genre that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre created in the first place and so um, yeah <laughs> I mean it was obviously made for the 80s teen audience reared on the films that the original ripped off you know this is uh, this is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre for the Friday the 13th generation, for the Freddy Krueger generation, for the Halloween generation. Um, and uh, it, you're, you're always on shaky ground when you have the original trying to imitate the people who are imitating you. Uh, it, be, it becomes cylindrical. It, um, it becomes almost... Uh, inbred in a way um a, a, a shoddy xerox copy of a shoddy xerox copy uh, pertaining to be the the original uh the plot of this film basically you have uh, dennis hopper no less uh fresh out of rehab and getting sober and uh, it, apparently just wanting to get back to work and uh, he accepted any old project that came along in 86 he made two films in, in 1986 that he, he just snatched out of the bag one in my view turned out very successful that was of course uh, him working with David Lynch and Blue Velvet but this film not so much uh, he, he's kind of on shaky ground and he, he you can kind of tell through his performance that he's a little bit embarrassed to be there uh, this this is Dennis Hopper slumming it I'd seen in in interviews in um, in later years when people ask him about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre he he feigns ignorance he he says was I in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre um, of course a reference to his his drink and drug days but of course, like I said, this film was made just after him leaving the Betty Ford Clinic. So uh, he, he can't claim that he blacked out for the whole three months that, that he was making this film, surely. Um, so you have Dennis Hopper and you have... Um, uh, he, he's the... Uh, the spoiler alert, but he's basically the uncle of uh, Franklin and Sally... The uh, the survivors of the well one of the survivors well the only survivor of the first film, and um, uh, Franklin the the guy in the wheelchair from the first film, and he's been on a revenge mission for the past thirteen years to find out his his nephew's slayers. Um, they do the, the the opening crawl states that the um, 
once S Sally went to the police, they went to find the, the house where she'd uh, experienced this horrible experience, but they, they couldn't find it. Funnily enough, they, there was um, an Australian horror film from 2005 which ripped off this... Uh, um, which, again, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, pertained to be a true story. Um, and, and the reason they, they could... Uh, whether, whether it is that based in fact or not uh, remains to be seen. But um, the way they got away with it saying it's a true story and not having the killer reprimanded at the end is they, they claim that um, <clears throat> they couldn't find the place where this uh, awful event was meant to happen. There it, it, it's more logical because... Um, it, uh, the, the way that story plays out the character wouldn't have been able to figure out where, where the exact geographical location of the uh, the events that they went through would have been but in here it's it's slightly less logical it's like well how, why couldn't Sally just re just find the house and why couldn't they have just said, oh, they, they did find the house and the characters flee? Um, it doesn't really make much logical sense that in uh, t 13 years they couldn't find the, this house where it, it all happened. Um, the uh, the uh, family from the original, um, well, the, the two surviving characters of the original, Leatherface and Pop, uh, oh, and Grandpa as well, They've they have fled from the original home and they they are now uh, in an abandoned carnival. Okay, so uh, there you go. This film set in an abandoned carnival, um, and um, basically you have as well as Dennis Hopper's character, uh, Lieutenant Enright. You also have Caroline Williams as uh, the DJ Stretch. And um, on one of her shows, she hears um, she overhears over a phone in some characters being killed off by Leatherface, and his new brother, who is apparently away in Vietnam, called Chop Shop. He, he's called Chop Shop because he's got a missing bit of skin missing from his head, and there's a metal plate visible underneath, which he keeps having to having to scratch with a. Uh, heated up coat hanger. Uh, I wasn't too, too sure whether it, I was a bit confused um, with, uh, watching it the first time around. I, I, cause I thought, okay, is he, is he meant to be the Hitcher character, and um, and he didn't die at the end of the uh, the first film, and uh, that's why he's got the metal plate in his head. But no, apparently this is a, a new character. This is, I mean, it's a different actor. Um, this uh, I think he ma makes reference to having Vietnam flashbacks. So okay, the, the I think as the, the series progresses, apparently the, there's more and more members of the Sawyer family come out of the woodwork. Uh, this one was happened to be in Vietnam. Um, although at least not he, he has the same birthmark as the Hitcher in the first film, but it's on the other side of his face. Uh, so that, that's why I was a little confused at first. I had to actually double check um, that he wasn't meant to be the same character. And um, the body of the Hitcher does appear towards the end of this film. So anyway, Stretch and um, and uh, Lieutenant Enright, they basically go on a, a mission to discover who's doing these murders. And they wind up in the carnival uh, where the the Sawyer family is hiding out, and the story kind of uh, well, basically, then just follows the the same beats as the original. Um, I'll just quickly talk about uh, what I did like ab ab about the films. There were there were one or two things I did like. Um, Tom Savini did the effects work, and um, you know it, he. He really was the best in the business back in the 80s, you know, producing corpses and uh, Leatherface's mask looks great in this. Um, so props up to Savini. Um, the production design, um, I, I like the 80s sort of smoky horror photography and lighting. 
Um, that, that's always uh, an entertaining aesthetic to it, to an 80s horror movie that you don't really get anymore. Although it is inconsistent uh, with the first film, like I say, like tonally, it, it's uh, one step removed from the first film. So, um, you know, I, I, I miss the, the gritty griminess of, of the, the 70s look of the, the first film because <clears throat> half the uh the power of the first film i think is the uh is the griminess of it in a funny sort of way although you get characters who are in an awful situation they've been captured by sadistic killers that's only half of the horror the, the other half of the horror of the first film is just the uh, the look of the place the the griminess of the the house that they they hold up in and there's a bit to, towards the end where Sally's been captured and uh, Pop grabs this dirty rag off the floor and shoves it in her mouth and just the dirty the dirt on this mag uh, mag on this rag in her mouth is almost as upsetting as some of the violence that the family uh, bestow on others and um, it, 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 it's it it makes it almost worse and because it feels realistic you know we can all relate to grime whereas this film has um a, a very synthetic look to it. it it feels more like a movie whereas the first one was uh shot with docudrama authentic authenticity so the but the like I said the look of the film is something i like um what I didn't like, like the there's some terrible performances from the Sawyer family in this <laughs> I'm sad to say. I mean the uh the dad character oh I won't say them the by names, well I've already said Bill mostly. Um I mean you know, he plays the character as written, sure, but uh, he um, he is irritating, you know, he laughs way too much. The the dad character this time around doesn't give a very good performance. He, he's kind of over the top and um, it's a different actor playing Leatherface this time around. And uh, he does this weird thing where he kind of shakes uh, when he, he's coming out after the... Uh, after his victims and uh, it, it looks kind of a little bit like your dad on the dance floor it, it's uh, it's it, I think it's meant to be scary but it looks a little uh, a little embarrassing I did like the the introduction of the character this time around I thought because I uh, the in the original film, the introduction to Leatherface is one of the great horror movie introductions, and uh, it, the way he just appears out of nowhere. And in, in this film, they they did it again. It, it's another shot reveal. Uh, out, out just come come comes out of the no out of nowhere, almost mid conversation, uh, and um, uh, and it's a real jolt when he does turn up. So um, I will give it that. Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's it's funny that I, I didn't like this film. Um, as, I'm usually a fan of the comedy entries in a series. I actually quite like Friday the Thirteenth Part Six. You know, uh, I like Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home. Um, I like when franchises have to re resort to doing the funny entry. Um. I think what maybe what held me back is um, is the fact that those films are genuinely witty and and do get laughs out of me, uh, whereas this one didn't. the The jokes they're kind of uh, I mean there's there's little digs here at things like Rambo three and the violence in those movies. Um, and the jokes are kind of uh, they're satirical, and you but you kind of end up going mm, yeah, nice point rather than laughing. And I, I think it 
if the if the film have managed to get some genuine laughs out of me, then maybe I'd I'd like it a bit more. Um, but as I say, you know, the Friday the Thirteenth. I mean that that was like part six in in. So they they done five films, five serious films by that point, and then that, so. <clears throat> It's it's almost a last resort when you have to go for laughs. So just making the the second entry in a series, it almost feels like you you're giving up way too early. Unfortunately, I mean this this is like making a sequel to The Exorcist, or because the, the first one is it, such a classic. Um, it, it it's like making Rosemary's Baby two and but make. But turning it into three men and a baby with devil worshippers, um, it, it's the, the, they took the the easy option too early, if you ask me. Yeah, um, yeah. On the whole, pretty poor. I'm sad to say, and uh, I don't know if I'll. Uh, I'll do any of the others in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Maybe I will one day. We'll see. So that's all I'm going to say for the moment. So until next time, folks, this is me, Big Buddha, signing off. And I shall see you all out there in YouTube land.